What's up, Daw Nation? Welcome to this week's episode of Behind the Daw with She Is Jewels. And really quickly, really quickly, She Is Jewels and Daw Nation have a free vocal sample pack for you. Link down in the description. Then down in the description. It's way harder to say than you think it is. Anyways, there's a link down there. I'm going to talk about it more later, but just know it's down there. It's waiting for you. It's pleading for you. It's begging for you. It's been yelling all day. That's what a vocal sample pack does because it's vocals. Anyways, if you're brand new to the podcast, this is a podcast where we interview uh, music producers, singers, songwriters, musicians, anyone on that spectrum on an emotional, philosophical, branding, marketing, and music business basis. Basically, if there's anything about a music career that you need to know, that you need to learn, this is the podcast where you are going to learn it. So if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. We're going to be talking about self-care and the importance of self-care, especially as a music producer and a songwriter. Secondly, we're going to be talking about tips and tricks for working with a vocalist. If you're a music producer, you're going to work with a vocalist. These tips and tricks are amazing. If you are a vocalist and you're working with music producers, they're going to be just as valuable. The third thing that we're going to talk about is finding your tribe. And the fourth thing that we're going to be talking about, I just hit my two rings together, make a sample pack out of that. Anyways, the fourth thing that we're going to be talking about is defending yourself in the music industry. The day will come but you need to defend yourself. People are going to be talking bad about you, slamming you in the comments, you know, trying to take advantage of you. What do you do? What do you do when that happens? We're going to be talking about it. And again, like I mentioned, we have a free sample pack for you. So if you want that free sample pack, it's a free vocal sample pack from Jules. It's from her song, Stop and Go. You can use it in any way that you want to. There is a link down in the description. Or if you're watching this on our website, there's a giant button below this video. Or if you can't get to any of those for whatever obscene reason, you can head on over to dawnation.net slash she is jewels. That's dawnation.net slash S-H-E-I-S-J-U-L-E-S. I'm terrible at spelling. I'm 29 years old. I still can't even spell opinion. And finally, if you currently can't sit down at your DAW and create every single day, if you are struggling with roadblock or writer's block or whatever variation of term that comes with that nowadays, if you are struggling with sitting down at your DAW, banging your head against your laptop, you I don't know how to create. I don't know what to create. You're scared of what other people think. You're, you, you don't know how to create the things that you want to. You don't know how to take your soul and put it into audio form. Then I highly encourage you to check out the Crywolf Masterclass. This is a masterclass that we have with Crywolf Makes Sense. Crywolf Masterclass that's to class with Crywolf. Anyways, this is where Crywolf is going to show you his system of creativity, where he can consistently create 30 songs in 30 days. It's insane. He can switch his creativity on at will. It doesn't matter what's going on in his life. If you want to find out more about that, you can head down to the links in the description, or you can head on over to donation.net slash Crywolf. But donation, with that being said, let's get into this week's episode of Behind the Dog. I want to welcome you back to another episode of Behind the Daw. In this week's episode, we have the chance to receive priceless wisdom and knowledge that you can't get anywhere else from She Is Jules. Jules, say what's up to Daw Nation. And if you'd be so kind, please let us know what is the biggest mistake that you've made in your music career. Hello. Thank you for having me on here. It would have to be being too precious. This is something I heard from someone a long time ago. They are like, whatever you do, don't ever be too precious with your songs. For me, that's just like over the years has been a huge theme in which I'll get like obsessed over a song or an idea and I won't ever put it out or I will be scared to show people because I'm like, I don't want anyone to like see this. That that has led me to, you know, being too scared to like show other people my ideas or maybe someone else seeing something in that idea. And it's definitely been, <laughs> it, it's kept me from a lot of those opportunities. So that has been one of like the biggest mistakes. Precious in this context, you being precious with your music, you're scared to show it to people, you feel like it's not ready, or maybe you get so attached to a certain idea, but you're like, ah, but it, I know it could be better kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And also like, I think there have been, I also take this into context of like, if you're in a session with someone else and you have this idea in your notes and you're like, I don't know if I should share it <laughs> because I want to keep this, like, this is a great idea. I guess the whole point of it is like, there's always going to be better ideas. Like you're always going to write better songs. The vicious, vicious trap of, yeah. of, of, um, ah, oh, this is good, but it's not great. Therefore I'm going to keep refining it for the next 15 years. And maybe by the yeah. time I'm middle-aged parent, I'll finally release my first song kind of thing. Right? 
<laughs> yes, exactly. No, exactly. And I'm I'm quite like a, a perfectionist when it comes to like cutting my own vocals or writing like a song. I just want to keep going back and into it. And, you know, sometimes we like look too closely when we need to really like take a step back and be like, okay, like, you know, maybe it, that's why it's good to like have other people's perspectives on on your songs and on your ideas. It's uh, <laughs> it can definitely become a vicious cycle. You know, I heard this this piece of advice has nothing to do with music, but we are going to make this do with music. Okay. (laughs) Um, I heard this advice many years ago before I got married, which was when you are looking to be married, you go into dating life with your eyes wide open, meaning like you're, Mm. you know, you're looking in multiple places, you're trying to get them, get to know them better. You know, so you're taking in a lot of information, so to say, but when you go into marriage, you go into it with your eyes half closed. At that point, you've injected all that information into you but now it's time to like stop being so hyper specific with everything because if you continue Mm. to be hyper specific into marriage that's when you start becoming nitpicky that's when it's like hey you didn't pick that up right hey you didn't fold that that dishcloth the proper way hey you you see what i'm saying and and it starts to become like overwhelming and i believe it to be the same with music right where it's like when you first go into it you come into it with your eyes wide open when you're creating a song what is all the stuff the creative stuff that i can inject into myself the stuff that i want to get out into the song so and so forth. But then towards the end, your eyes start, your eyes should start to close a little bit, not be so picky on every little thing. Yeah. Oh, the frequency's peeking out there. This is feeding there. Oh, I could have <laughs> did this extra harmony, so on and so forth. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, definitely. And you know, what's funny is like a few years ago, I was, I like had this idea to write a song that was like, you think it's about a boyfriend or something. And it's actually, you're talking with your creativity because I believe that your creativity Creativity is, it could feel like another, like a relationship, you know, like with yourself. So it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I've had that idea. I'm like, that would be interesting because it's something that I feel like I deal with a lot is talking back and forth to myself and being too hard on myself. I love the idea of of creativity, like like you, you, even though it's a part of yourself, you know what I mean? Like creativity is like your creative part of you is part of you having this yeah. relationship with a certain part of you, I feel like is really interesting. And I really, really actually would like to dive further into that, but really quick donation, make sure to stay tuned throughout the entire episode, because not only are Jules and I going to bring you just value after value after value, but at the end of the episode, we're going to be talking about what is the greatest choice that she has made inside of her music career. So make sure to stay all the way to the end. Okay. But with that being said, let's get back to talking about this concept with your relationship with creativity, because one of the things that we Mm -hmm. talked about before we hopped into this episode was actually developing that relationship with that creativity so it's a healthy relationship right so that so that Mm. when you do sit down at the DAW when you do sit down to write in the notebook you pick up the guitar you do whatever that relationship has already been formed and it's been nurtured and it's and it's kind of good to go right so tell me more about what are some of the things that you do or some of the some of the opinions that you have for self-care when it comes to your creativity I'd love to know more about that for my creativity I think you definitely have to to be emotionally like healthy. And what I mean by that is uh, like taking time for yourself. And it's, you know, you hear about like self-care and becoming more of a trend, but it is so true. You need to make time for yourself, whether that just be like with the book or folding laundry or taking care of yourself, like to fuel yourself to be the best you can be. It's just so important. I've definitely gotten to a place before where I was like not really taking care of myself, not really caring after myself and it led me to a place where I was just like, I creatively could not make the best music that I could. And it's super important. And I think it's super important to like also creatively fuel, fuel yourself with, you know, movies, TV, poems, all that good stuff, or even life experiences and hanging out with friends and their experiences. Not only in music, this is definitely a music culture, but mm-hmm. I mean, just in, in normal everyday culture, we see this all the time. It's actually like, I see the, the two extremes come into play when it comes to self-care. On one end of the spectrum, it's like, screw self-care. You are supposed to be working 14 hours every single day. You're supposed to be relentlessly just going, going, going. Uh How dare you take time to eat? How dare you take time to shower? How Mm -hmm. dare you take time for yourself? And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is, bro, you only have one life. Why don't you enjoy it? (laughs) You know, be completely fine with making $3 an hour as a waitress. Just do whatever you want all the time. Don't push yourself. It's fine. You know what I mean? I'm assuming where you're coming from is like somewhere 
in the middle, right? Where it's like, oh, of course, per- push yourself, but realize that like you you are literally a human and you need time to rest and rejuvenate, right? That's where we're coming from. Yeah, okay. definitely. I think that it, it's so important to like be, at least for me, like in the middle with that because I've gotten to places in my life where I'm just like, all I want to do is like hang out with friends, go to the beach, you know, and which is great, but you know, there's got to be more to life than just like chilling. But then at the same time, I've gotten to other extremes where it was like, felt like I was working myself to death. That's not healthy either. (laughs) So kind of trying to find that, that healthy balance between trusting that everything is going to go well, but also somewhere in, somewhere in the middle, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. 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 I see what you're saying. You brought up a really interesting concept though, when we were, before we started recording, which is making sure it's not only like taking the time for you to be able to to rejuvenate so to say it's not necessarily just that it's also making the work sm- how do i say this it's like it's like making yourself work smarter in the long run right so mm-hmm. like for example if you do take that time to rejuvenate but the things that you do when you are rejuvenating will actually make you more creative when you do work you're knocking yeah. down two birds with one stone right and yeah. so not only is it taking time to rejuvenate but it's it's taking time to rejuvenate and make your work easier in the long run, right? I find that so freaking smart. I am obsessed with optimization, right? I'm obsessed Uh with workflow. I'm obsessed with knocking out 14 birds with one stone. And so, you know what I mean? Like I am, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just enthralled by this idea. And so this is what was crazy to me when I realized that artists can do this, right? So an artist, like if they like, you mentioned reading books, like if they really enjoy reading books in their downtime, they could read books that fuel their creativity so that when they come back to, to create music, Music, that creativity is already there and when they get exhausted they could go fill their creativity by relaxing and reading a book and it's yeah. just like thinking about i'm like <gasps> i totally got that it's so and that's what's cool is like you don't even realize that you're doing it for your own good until like afterwards and you're like oh shoot like this first of all i feel like not terrible and i feel like <laughs> i'm you know i'm taking time for myself but i'm also creatively like storing up like all these thoughts and ideas for like this next song or something that I'm going to write in the future. And yeah, it, it is kind of like killing two birds with one stone. So when you do these things, right, when you're when you are participating in in creative self care, so to say, right, do you do you have like a method of keeping <laughs> track of that inspiration? Because that's one thing that I've noticed with myself. It's like, okay, you know, like I'm having a grand old time playing Zelda here. And <laughs> this is creative, like the music's incredible. The visuals are incredible. High five. However, I don't feel like I was necessarily partaking of it actively is like passively. Like I was just like, wow, that's really cool. And then a day later, I'm like, wait, why was that cool? As opposed to if I saw something really cool, I'm like, this is inspiring. What is inspiring about this? It's the visuals. It's the music. Okay. Write this down somewhere Mm. so I could leverage this information later. Right. Do you do that? Or like, what's your method with that? Once I hear something like I'm, I'm pretty like OCD. So I'll like take out my phone and I will like either record something like the other night I had this dream. Mm -hmm. I woke up, I had this dream that I was writing a song and I woke up in the middle of the night and recorded it like as soon as possible. (laughs) I'm super forgetful as well. So like I make sure to get everything down. It's always different every single time Mm. how I come up with songs, but I always make sure I have my phone or even a notebook, which I know is kind of, you know, old school, but I I will write everything down. Even if it sounds like crap, like I'm going to write it down. There's really no, you know, like method, but I will say like fueling myself by taking care of of myself and getting up in the morning and like working out and journaling is like that is I do that every single day because that Ooh. that's what fuels me and enables me to be better in every single way and then be better as a creative. You mentioned getting up in the morning. Are you an early riser? <laughs> I'm actually not, but like, ah, I, it's no, <laughs> I'm like, you know, like 7, 8 a.m. Oh, it that's really totally an early riser for the music <laughs> industry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For music, for sure. No, my, my family, they're all real estate agents. So they like get up at like <laughs> 5 a.m., go work oh. out, have their protein shake. And I'm like, they think I'm like a bum. <laughs> so. <laughs> but not really. They don't think I'm a bum, but they definitely think that I like wake up later and are like the typical musicians. You know how you're it is. Not, you're not the typical musician. If you if, if you wake up before noon, you are not the typical musician. <laughs> so the second thing that you mentioned in there, which was 
journaling. And just mm. to clarify, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same type of journaling, right? Because mm. in my mind, there's there's kind of two different types of journaling. Number one is this is what happened in my day. This is what I went through. High five. That was great. Then there's a second type of journaling, which is just like, I got stuff in my mind. I don't know what it is. It's not coherent. It's not necessarily about today. It's just coming out and I'm just writing and writing and writing and writing. Are you, which type mm. of journaling are you talking about? Some days it, it really depends. Like mm-hmm. there's a, a part of my writing where I'll just like, sometimes, some days I'll wake up and I'm just like, I need to vent. I just need to write this down. But most of the time I'm, I'm Christian. So I take the time to uh, just fuel up that way, like read my Bible and everything. It's different for everyone. I think I, I heard from someone that they were like, you need to write down everything that you're thinking in the morning. It's like this weird book. Someone said like this book said to journal the first like the moment that you wake up, you'll get like all the crap out. It's like flushing your <laughs> your creative system or something. Mm-hmm. And that might be like, you know, a bunch of like BS, but that's kind of that's kind of interesting because I journal anyways every single morning because that just helps me like keep my head on straight. It does make sense. <laughs> I do agree with what you're saying though, because do you know do you know who Crywolf is? Do you ever you ever heard of Crywolf? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we did we did a course with him and it was all about creativity and he explained the three different type of consciences, consciousness. One being there's a conscious where you and I are aware, right? We are aware that we're in a podcast interview right now. I'm aware mm-hmm. I'm in an office. I'm aware, you know, so on and so forth, right? Then mm-hmm. there is your subconscious, which is information that you have retained, but isn't necessarily in the forefront of your mind. Like for example, yeah. we're bringing something out of your subconscious right now, right? What was your best friend's name in fourth grade? Rachel. Rachel, <laughs> great. You weren't thinking about that 30 seconds ago, right? So it wasn't. I wasn't. It wasn't You're like that's the equivalent of you going into the hard drive and finding something that wasn't on your yeah. desktop, so to say. Right. And, yeah. then, and then there is the unconscious, which is the ultra deep, really deep down style stuff. This is like the coding of you. Right. This is like the, the stuff that you didn't even know, like that you were taking in. It's almost like this superior being that's constantly taking in information. But you didn't even know that you were taking in information in the first place. At least from what I have found in the mornings, mm-hmm. right when you wake up, the relationship or like the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious is ridiculously short. Like it's to me that makes sense. Like in the morning where I'm like writing, I'm like, what? Is, what is this? What? Is, how yeah. does this fit together? What? Is, this is yeah. beautiful. This is weird. This is whatever. Only later on to see it all come together and be like, ah, oh, yeah, like, right. Is that? Do you have a similar experience to that? No, definitely. Yeah. I mean, do you do you journal like in the morning? I or do like- every morning. So I'm similar <gasps> yes. to you, where like I get up and I read my scriptures and like just allow whatever to come out, come out, and I and I write it down. I put it in a voice note. I do something. So I'm very similar to you in that. No, that's like because that was similar to I forget what the book was called, but someone had like told me it was from this book. I didn't actually read the book. Uh-huh. Like you were saying, like essentially just cleaning out, taking something from your your consciousness. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Totally. Like what you're explaining, I guess. And totally, totally. Um that totally like makes sense. And it's it's weird like how that comes about. This is kind of going in another direction. But last year I was dealing with a lot of health issues mm-hmm. myself and I wasn't taking care of myself. I was working really late. Like at the time I was in LA. Right now I'm up in San Francisco mm-hmm. area. But I was working super late, just really not taking care of myself, not, not with it and dealing with all these health issues. And it really, it really got to me. And it wasn't until like I was forced to stop and just, you know, take a, take a breath. I realized like, oh, like this is really important to, you know, be with my family, be with my friends, be present you know, and and take care of myself first and have like my relationships more important than my work. And yeah, it's something I have to remind myself every single day because I'm, you were saying earlier, you love to like optimize and Mm -hmm. see how you can like work your best. Like I am the same way. It can kind of drive me to places where I'm like, (laughs) oh my gosh, like it is like 2 a.m. and I'm like, still in the studio and which you know is fine every once in a while but for me it's just I was like this is too much so so <laughs> when you say that you were forced to stop so you were you were working late I'm assuming you were probably working long hours and working late at the same time you know yeah. probably not taking care of yourself so tell, tell us more about that was it like was there extreme deadlines were you just pushing yourself trying to impress the people you were working with like what, what was going on with that about the the end around like September October of 2019 I was working a three jobs to oh like God. fund my uh independent artist album thing mm-hmm. that I had going on I was like <laughs> 
babysitting, door dashing, and was working at an accounting office at the same time while doing my music. And not, it's funny because a lot of people like don't even, for the longest time, they're like, oh, you just do music. I'm like, no, I do <laughs> lots of things <laughs> just to be able to do my music. I was doing all those things on top of my music. I was working with, which I think we'll go into later, but I was working in a not so healthy environment with some some people and caused me a lot of stress. And I've always had stomach issues my whole life. I remember one day I was door dashing <laughs> and just, you know, just walking along. And I've had this like pain in my stomach for like the past um, like couple months. And I was like not really thinking anything of it, but I was door dashing and I like had to stop. Like I was like, oh my gosh, like my, my stomach hurts so bad right now. And I remember just sitting on the curb and I was like, okay, I need to go home. I told my dad, I was rushed to the ER. And then after like multiple like tests that I had to go through, I was, my mom, she, she has an autoimmune disease and we were just testing for that. Thank God I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Put me to a place where I was like, I literally, like I need to take care of myself. Stopped working um, two of my jobs and worked one of them. That unhealthy relationship that I was in with like my working relationship, I like cut my ties and I was just like, you know, no hard feelings. This is just not mm -hmm. for me. And I did what I had to do, you know, just to be like, okay, in that sense, you know, and find my way essentially back to, to feeling good. Like we were discussing earlier, we, we live in a society that like pushes you until something like this happens. You know what I mean? Like it seems like every other day I'm hearing about someone that's like, they're just pushing themselves so hard. They're only getting three hours of sleep. They haven't, mm -hmm. they're, you know, on average, they're eating one meal a day, you know, like something like that, just because they're working so hard and so relentless to the point where like it gets them sick. And listen, I'm no, I'm no, I'm not, I'm not going to excuse myself with that. Mm -hmm. Over Thanksgiving, I stayed up for 42 hours and worked 33 of those hours straight. Like it sucked. Mm. Like I had to do that because the project had to get done. So I get it. Do I recommend it? Was it, would, would I have not done that unless it was absolutely necessary? Heck freaking no. Like that's, yeah. that was a miserable experience. However, I totally respect you for sharing that because I mean, that, Thank it, you. it sucks regardless, you know, for you to have to have go, gone through that. So now you actually, you did allude to this and this is something that we talked about uh, before we hopped into this episode, which is to really talk about kind of the culture and kind of this this common theme that you and I have seen between you know like male producers and female vocalists. The vast majority of the producers in the industry are male, and the vast majority of the vocalists in the industry are female. I, mm -hmm. I I truly hope our listeners are not you know like wanting to kill me at this point for <laughs> stating some type of fact like that, but that is what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah you yeah. and I can both attest to this. But I have found that like more often than not, I always hear this from the vocalist side, mm. not so much from the producer side, but I hear this from the vocalist side a lot. Like they were mistreated in some way. The producer did something that made the vocalist feel uncomfortable or yeah. did something that was massively inappropriate. So I'd love to talk more about that mainly because like the, 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 the listeners at Dawn Nation, they are good people, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I think they deserve to actually hear about this so that they don't fall into that trap. You know what I mean? So yeah. that they're like, when they're working with female vocalists, they're not being stupid. They're doing things that maybe they didn't know that was quote unquote bad you know what I mean mm -hmm. but later on I mean like oh you're right I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have acted like that I shouldn't have you know so on and so forth right and yeah. so let's talk about that so I mean share as much details as is appropriate with what happened in your experience or or, or whatnot but yeah so like let's talk more about that subject I guess for me was a situation where I was like basically only working with this person. I did, <laughs> I didn't really see that what was going on until I started working with other people and was like, oh, this isn't normal. This is kind of weird. A situation where it was like, that, like lots of yelling, very verbal. I'm one of those people, like, I think I'm a decent person. Yeah, yeah. Um, very bubbly. <laughs> and, yeah, I could agree with that. And I'm like, I'm not one of those people that like, if someone yells at me, I cry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. I'm a whip. <laughs> so oh. no, but I was, I was telling like one of my, my female vocalist friends about this. And I was like telling her all these other things that had gone on, just things that made me feel uncomfortable, things that really hurt me and were kind of like mentally messing with my, like, it was like messing with my head and making me think all these weird things. You would say like lots of sexist things. And I was mm. like, oh, that's weird. Why would you say that? You know? And I told my friend this and she's like, oh, that's not, that's not normal. And that's when I came to the point where I was like, oh, you're right. Like this isn't normal. <laughs> it's just so important to have 
your tribe or your people that you do in music, you know? And like, for me, that was like finding other female vocalists who have gone through the same thing. I've had friends, female friends who like, they walked into a studio and like a guy was like, Hey, if you do this, like I'm a do that. Like I'm a get you the steal or something. It like, that's thankfully I've never had to experience anything like that. But like, it happens to literally every single female vocalist that I talk to. And and again, like that never happened to me, but it doesn't make it right. It, it doesn't make it right. And and just to be completely flat out clear, if if any vocalists are, are listening to this and that ever happens to you, if you go into a studio and they say, hey, if you do X, Y, Z, if you do this current sexual act with me, I will get you this deal. I'll give you this collab. I'll do this. I'll give you free studio time, whatever. Number one, that's a felony. You should churn them in 110%. Definitely do that. Also, mm-hmm. In my opinion, they deserve to be kicked in the throat. But, you know, that's that's a different conversation. <laughs> so that should never, ever happen. If someone ever suggests to do that, number one, please turn them in. But if you don't have the courage to turn them in, definitely don't take the deal because the vast majority of the time, those deals don't work out. I mean, yeah. we're talking about some of the most selfish, twisted people on earth. I appreciate you sharing that because this is this is messed up. And I think we can both agree here that most male producers are not like this. If most male producers are like this, I mean, like every day we would hear like three or four cases of this happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is definitely, you know, like not that often, still more often than it should be, but it's still, it's still not that often. And so we're not trying to say that all male producers are trash. And so I'm a male producer myself. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't. Yeah. That's not at all what I'm saying. And right. like, this was a very specific situation and like, even like the, my friend's situation was very spe- specific. I don't know any of these people, but yeah, if you're ever in a situation like that, yeah, definitely tell someone, make sure that you're safe. It is unfortunate because I do hear it a lot from singers that are in LA. Like I hear it a lot in LA. Yeah. You know? Well, first off, you mentioned that this male producer that you were working with was yelling at you. First off, male producers, in fact, female producers and any producers out there, yelling is not going to help. It's not. Yeah. You know, I don't care if... <laughs> Like, I don't know specifically what he yelled at you for, whether he was just mad at you in general or because you didn't sing something right or you showed up late or whatever. Frankly, it doesn't matter. There's a saying we say in our household, there's only one reason why you should yell, and that's if the house is on fire. Demonstrate, like, unless a human life is being threatened, no yelling should happen because it's not not useful. In a professional music situation... Yeah. What? Why would you... Yeah. So my dad, he has been my... He's in music too, but he has been my... My manager, my dadager, if you will, um, the past like couple of years. And this happened right like after he left. And so my my parents, I just remember like three, no, what time? I like got home really late and I was staying at this producer's friend's house. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I don't even know if I could stay here. Is she going to kick me out? Like, I don't mm-hmm. even know. My parents felt helpless. They're like, I was like, I was like, I don't even know what to tell them. Even months after this occurred, like it came into this year, same sort of situation. It was trying to manipulate me. And and Mm -hmm. like, I'm like, I'm not even, I thought we, we like, I'm not, (laughs) I'm not coming back. Like, (laughs) and my parents felt helpless because they weren't there. And I'm just really, I'm super close with my parents. And I know I'm 22 years old, but you know, in a situation like that, I would be scared if my kid was like totally. facing this sort of stuff. Like I mentioned, I babysat a lot. So I'm like, I love kids. Totally. And you know, it's, it hurts me like to think about other people who go through situations that are way worse than this, because um, I'm very lucky that nothing crazy ever happened. But doesn't you know? It doesn't make it right, like we said. Going down this route, I'd also love like to know like what are some other things that either you've experienced with male producers or that you you've had friends experience with male producers that they've done, which is just like I'm, I'm not talking about like the extreme stuff. It's more yeah, so yeah. the stuff that's like that's like oh well, I mean you know, like they did this and like oh that's not kind of cool. It kind of like killed the vibe with what we had going on, and it kind of you know made the music process go slower or. or didn't really aid the music creation process and so on and so forth. Like, do you have some examples of that? In our society, there is a need to like be better, bigger, faster, you know, stronger, like whatever. This is sort of going a little bit back to what we were saying earlier. There'll, there'll be like producers, this happens to me all the time. There'll be some producers who text me at like 4am and they're like, Hey, will you write to this track? And I'm like, (laughs) like, yo, (laughs) I was leaving. I'll have people be like, hey, like, I need you to call me and blah, blah, blah. Like, try to sweet talk me. Or I'll have, I remember like one time with me, I was talking to some guy and they're like, oh, first of all, I want to say I'm a Taylor Swift fan, but um, <laughs> but he said to me, it's like, you, you got to just like keep dating and like breaking up with 
break up with your boyfriend and date other people and then you could write songs like Taylor Swift. And I was like, that's a little like demeaning to think we have to like, women have to sleep around to like, to make great songs. Like that's not, yeah, like that killed a vibe for sure. Number one, guys, don't, don't text them in the middle of the night. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, like this is, I mean, I know the producers stay up late, a high five. If that's what you want to do, go for it. But please wait until like normal human hours to text <laughs> people. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's just yeah. like human decency. Like that's not yeah. even, right. You wouldn't text your lawyer at four o'clock in the morning. You yeah. Know, you get in contact in, a re- in reasonable hours of the day. Number two, just don't talk about relationship stuff. It's just, just, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you are being professional, you are being professional. Like, listen, there are some producers mm-hmm. that meet vocalists and then something happens and high five. You know what I mean? And it's magical and it's wonderful. I've heard this many, many times over. However, try and keep it as professional as possible. You know what I mean? If they have a boyfriend, don't tell them to break up with their boyfriend. I legit, like I had this one producer who's like, you need, he, he said, like, you need to write about sex. You need to like swear in your music and you have to break up with your boyfriend. I was like, what? It's super uncomfortable. And it's just yeah. like so uncalled for. I'm like, why, why, how, like, totally. how did this happen? Is there any other things that they've, that, that you've seen male producers do? You're like, please stop, please just stop. It also has to go into like a conversation of, especially like independent artists. You know, if someone like is like charging a fee and whatnot, I usually, I always respect that. I want to make sure I always give them what, what they need. Cause there, there, this is a job, you know, like sure, you're sure. doing me like a favor. You're like, I'm paying you for this job. You know, I've had some, uh, male producers like try to like, if, if I was charging a fee and everything, try to like talk to me over the phone and like sweet talk me and like manipulate me. And, you know, I'm like, I'm like, you would not do this to anyone to anyone else. And oh my gosh, I just thought of another thing. I'm sorry. I'm kind of just going on a tangent go, right now. Go, go, go. Um, <laughs> I had a a friend of mine go to a label and she's married, has a kid. And this label said straight to her face. They're like, like, you're not going to be able to tour because, you know, you got you have a (laughs) husband and a kid. I'm like, you would never say that to a man (laughs) ever. Why would you say these things? So this is one thing that I have heard time and time and time again, which is producers treating vocalists as though they are below the producer. Laura Bram, we did a really great episode years ago about this concept because she said the same thing, right? Or, you know, Laura Bram, right? Yeah. She's went through the same thing where it's like the vocalist is not treated on the same level as the producer, whether mm-hmm. whether either of them are female or male, it doesn't matter. It does seem as though the vocalist somehow is less than the producer in this aspect, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And is treated accordingly to that and 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 to me that's just that's never really properly made sense to me because it's like dude that song wouldn't come together unless the vocalist was there you know what i mean it's like yeah when you have such an integral part of something why would you treat them as though they are not integral you know what i mean, to, I, mean that's, it, I feel like that's a weird thing to have an opinion no. on but apparently i have an opinion on it <laughs> my male like writers that I'll, I'll write with who are like helping me top line something they'll get treated the same way it kind of just doesn't really matter at that point with like yeah. vocalists and treat vocalists as professionally as literally you would treat anyone else right you would you wouldn't treat if you go in to get surgery and the anesthesiologist comes in you're not gonna be like oh like he's so below the surgeon oh my gosh like you would you, <laughs> you would never do that like both of them are important for different reasons right and it's the same thing with the producer and and a, and a vocalist you see them as both like integral people Pieces. And when you are hiring someone out or you're having someone come and perform a service for you, in this case, you know, recording a vocal, you treat that as professional. I don't I don't understand why this is again, like this is, this seems like a strange thing to have an yeah. opinion on because I feel like <laughs> basic human knowledge would suggest to treat people professionally when you are in a professional environment doing professional things for your profession. This seems like a weird thing to have an opinion on. Sometimes there will be producers who will, you know, hey, like right on this track and whatnot. I'm like, yo, <laughs> like this is a great track it's just like kind of they expect you to just like do it somehow the vocalist if they can't write on the track they choose not to write on the track they don't want to write on the track somehow they're just they're idiots they're not useful they're not as talented they're they're hard to work with and so on and so forth but mm-hmm. like dude if we flip that and, and set it on the producer mm-hmm. standpoint it's like you know like what if i came to you and i said hey i want you to produce dubstep you're like i'm actually a hip-hop producer oh my gosh he's so hard to work with yeah if you pitch something to a vocalist and they're like hey this isn't for me or i don't feel like i'm the best person for it well th- 
why what yeah. why is that a bad thing i've had some producers like be like talking badly about like people that i know like vo- vocalists i'm like and then i would have to say no to this person who is talking badly about other people i'm like <laughs> i know he's gonna say something but either way mm. i'm like i'm damned if i do i'm damned if i don't it's really important to like protect your own heart because i'm horrible at saying no <laughs> to people. And you never know what's going to happen when you say no uh, to someone. And Mm. like I mentioned before, that weird situation I had with a producer, it was like when I said no to like some sort of split thing. I'm not even, I don't even remember. I was kind of like open, but saying no um, in that situation, I was, I was like, I'm, I'm open to discussing, but like, not really. Like you never know how people are going to react. It gives you peace to know that you did everything you could to um, protect yourself. There's another subject that you and I talked about before we started I would really like to dive into before before we uh, close this up, which is really the struggles of an independent artist, which I feel like we've already went over some of them so yeah. far, right? Like like filling your creative cans teen, so to say, is like the first one, and and the fem- the the male producer and female vocalist dynamic, right? And so mm-hmm. now I would love to know, like, what are some of the other like really hyper struggles that you go through as an independent artist that maybe maybe people don't know about? You know, they need to be aware of this if they're going to walk down that path, right? What's great is, as I mentioned before, I do you like before we got to mm-hmm. recording I uh, have been doing some more like TikTok stuff about like in being an independent artist and there have been so many people who are like how do I get started and I guess there's a lot of struggles it's like not for the faint of heart is that what they say <laughs> most of the time you kind of have to hustle and I don't like using that word a lot but like at the beginning of it it's it's kind of like you gotta give yourself time to like understand like all these things and how much it costs and you're like oh my gosh then there's on top of that there's is like finding your people and working with the people that you feel like is like your quote unquote tribe or like your the people that you work with and there's so many like <laughs> I feel yeah. like overwhelmed I'm like how many like there's there's a lot of things that are are struggle but even just promoting yourself without like a label or all those things and then like recording yourself that's how you're gonna do it like it isn't cheap for sure so there's yeah. there's a couple of things that you brought up that I feel like that we could dive into a little bit more so very first the first thing that you talked about was like you having three jobs my gosh <laughs> (laughs) I get that. I totally get that. But yeah, first off, the like the financial strain of it all. And especially, I mean, like if when you were living in LA, I'm assuming you probably were living on the street. So you probably had somewhere to stay. So you probably had to pay rent or something equivalent to that, right? Yeah. I was actually like most of the time I was doing two weeks up here and two weeks down there. So that almost that cost it that probably costed more just by traveling rather than just staying in one place. But I'm I'm a Bay Area kid at heart. Costed money. (laughs) But you know, thankfully I'm so I'm so blessed because my parents believe in me and my family believes in me and they've been able to, you know, help me like cover expenses. Most of the time I was just, I was staying on like friends of friends couches and mm, watching okay. their cat. <laughs> they let me watch their, stay on their couch if I watched their cat. And that was oh. super helpful. You know, I love cats. Totally. Still, I mean, the fact that you were, you still had to pay to live and eat and you had to travel. Yeah. And so like the financial that, I mean, really, and this isn't, this isn't exclusive to just independent music. Yeah. Uh, in, in, independent uh, musicians. Like, I mean, if you started, if you started a mom and pop shop, you started a donut shop, you started an e-commerce store, whatever, like the, mm-hmm. the financial investment up front is usually what people like, that's kind of what people like deters people away. They're like, wait, I didn't realize it's going to cost money. And it's like, what? Do you, what? what? Like, <laughs> What do you mean yeah. you didn't realize this cost money? Like driving across town costs money. You think starting a business is going to be free? You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, of course this is going to cost money. And so, but to be aware of that up front, it's like, listen, this is going to cost money. You're going to have to save money here and you probably work an extra job there. Just something, you have to do something, right? Yeah. In order to get this off the ground, right? It's funny because, you know, you... You're like, oh, like, I'm just like, I'm going to jump right into this artist thing. And it's like, I don't know. I heard from someone like if you're planning to like just do music or just like take on like a creative new thing, you, you better have like three months of of like uh, just what it takes to live saved up. As of right now, I I only do music, which is I'm so grateful. And I it's awesome. I thank God every single day that I'm able to to do this and be with my parents right now. And especially with COVID, it has been like a whole brand new world. Like people are like, you know, struggling hard with no shows and everything. When you want to start at least having like three months of expenses already saved up, you should have that anyways. Yeah. <laughs> just be, yeah. You know, like, like just like being financially, you know, intelligent. I feel like that's, you should have that anyways. Yeah. Just for a, a bajillion different reasons. I wanted to talk about the other point. So you said, oh, finding your tribe. There, there is going to be a time when you're kind of like an awkward middle schooler again, right? Yeah. Where you're kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> trying to find the people that you fit in with, like what scene do you go with, so on and so forth. And that's okay. Like as long as you plan for 
that, it's it's not a shock, right? It's a shock when you when you go into the music industry, bright eyes and bushy tails, and oh, you're like, yeah. this is gonna be so freaking easy. This is gonna be so easy. Like, I'm gonna find my tribe, like everyone loves me, like so on and so forth. Only to find out later, it's like, okay, like I actually really don't like any of you, <laughs> and this is not working. You have found your tribe, right? Is that is that correct? I think I'm also still in a process of finding my tribe as well. Like I, I have people that I work with regularly and then I have, I, I'm always reaching out to different people. I'm Italian. So I love like, I'm very, I'm an extrovert <laughs> and I love meeting people. So I guess like I, I'm still, I'm still trying to really, you know, figure that out in some areas, but definitely with like the top lining, like that whole community of like young female vocalists, I've been able to, like, I have like a group chat with a bunch of them. <laughs> it's so funny. It's never anything weird. We're just like, like you you go girl. Like we're so, it's so cheesy, but it's like, sometimes you need that, you know, even if it's like, we're not really necessarily making music together. It's like, I feel like I have friends in music who understand what I'm going through. If I'm going through something rough or if I need advice on something, there's, you know, having a tribe that helps you with your, you know, your music and your creative vision. And then there's your tribe that who's there for you, like as a friend or like emotionally or creatively, um, your friend. And I, I completely agree. I feel like you have to have that. In fact, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, you know, like I'm the I'm the stoic type. I'm like, I'm, I'm the type that can do this all on my own. I don't need help. I don't need to have a tribe around me. I'm going to do everything on my own. Well, you're, you're going against human nature there, buddy. We're literally built to, to do that. So you might as well just learn how to play the game. And there's a lot of benefits to that. So I, I love that you have that tribe. Number one, when things are going hard, you can lean on that tribe. You yeah. got that tribe. Guys, am I really good? Oh, shut up. You're amazing. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. To have, to have that or like to get feedback on stuff or to like pitch ideas to or so on and so forth. Like that, that is like invaluable. Right. And so knowing mm-hmm. that from day one to be an independent artist, do guys find your tribes ASAP. Yeah. That, I think that's, I think that's super, super valuable. So we've talked about money. We've talked about tribe. Is there any other struggles of an independent artist that you really want to double down on? Ooh, uh, I guess this is a weird one, but it kind of just popped into my head, like <laughs> standing up for yourself, I guess, Ooh, um, <laughs> which is a one. whole like thing, but it is so important to not let people walk all over you just because, you know, you don't have a deal yet or you're doing it on your own. Like I've dealt with some of that and that's not fun. And then people, people will come around and be like, you know, after they said stuff and you're doing well, you know, mm-hmm. a totally different thing. Yeah, I guess like standing standing up for yourself and like knowing that like you have boundaries and you have standards and that's that's okay. You should be treated though that way, you know, like not trying to be like, you know, stuck up or anything, but it's like you need to you need to set boundaries and and everything. You totally should set boundaries. Number one, because you respect yourself. Yeah. Right. Like you you have just like you have a relationship with your creativity, you also have a, a relationship with your kind of whole self. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And when you stick up for yourself, you feel more comfortable with yourself. You know, you don't don't feel like you left yourself down. Letting yourself down is one of the worst feelings ever. There's one thing that was that was said to me once. I don't know who said it. Apparently they're a genius because it's <laughs> really good information or really good advice, which was there's no industry in the world and there's no person in that industry in the world where if you lose a relationship with that person, you will relo- you will lose every relationship ever in that industry. Mm. Meaning this is a fear that most people have, right? Like they fear that if they piss off this record label head or if they piss off this producer or this vocalist, they're ruined at, the, at that point, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to stick up for myself. I don't want to do this thing because I don't want to offend this person. I don't want to burn those those relationships down so that it affects me in a negative way in the music in the music industry, right? And that's a whole bunch of crap. Yeah. To be to actually honest, like literally, if tomorrow the CEO of some big record company came to you and was like, "Okay, like uh, like you're terrible, you're worthless, you're awful, I hate you, I'm gonna make your life a living hell," if they said that to you, like you have every right to stick up for yourself, and yeah. you sticking up for yourself isn't going to to damn your your music career at that point. Yeah. In fact, you're going to get massive respect from other people to know that you just went toe to toe with the record label head and you stood (laughs) up for yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's an extreme example, but, you know, in a, in a more realistic example, what happens is like people will say something and you stick up for yourself and they actually respect the heck out of you for doing that. Right. Mm-hmm. I've worked with many people in the industry and some of them were massively, massively, massively bigger than I was. Mm-hmm. And I stuck up for myself in certain things. They're like, hey, you're going to do this. I'm like, actually, I don't think that's OK. I'm going to I don't think we should do that. I think we should do this. All the respect, Jules. All the <laughs> 
like all of a sudden, because you are projecting yourself on the same level as them, you are no longer beneath them. You are no longer some some peasant. You're like you've rose yourself up to the point where you're like, listen, we're both you know we're both dukes and lords here, so to say. Mm-hmm. So let's work together as that. You know, does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, no, exactly. And like I think that's that's something with I that I dealt with for the longest time was like Ugh. when I was in that that situation, I was like, oh my gosh, like I was always told never to burn a bridge, but there yeah. comes a point where it's like you need to set boundaries and you. Know, know, it's out of respect for myself and for the other person. I don't want to waste their time anymore. It helps it helps both both of you by by saying no or just making those boundaries clear. It took me a long time to learn. <laughs> let me tell you that, but it's <laughs> it's one of the most useful things that I I could have learned especially in this past year. I think it is important to distinguish the difference between setting boundaries and burning a bridge, right? Yeah. Because because burning a bridge is like juvenile. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like because they didn't get me the song back on time or because they're asking me to sing a certain thing that I don't want to. I'm going to Twitter and just like thrashing them to bits and yeah. saying they're idiots and flipping over the chair as I walk. Things that you intentionally do to ruin a relationship because of like juvenile acts. That's not probably, the, that's not a proper definition, but you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, no, Whereas, exactly. Like, but setting a boundary is like, hey man, like I'm sorry, but I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think this is right. I don't think I deserve to be talked to like this. I don't feel comfortable with this, so on and so forth. I feel like that's completely acceptable to say. And that's not burning bridge. That's setting a boundary. That's and true. Again, in yeah. my in my opinion, the more you do that, the more respect you'll actually get. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think, yeah, it's really good to be specific with, with like what burning a bridge is because I was like, for the longest time, I was just like, is this what I'm doing by sticking up for myself? And like, that's not at all what it is. So I believe it's time for us to go ahead and fulfill on our original promise at the beginning of the episode where we are going to, where we were going to discuss what is the greatest decision that you have made inside of your music industry or inside your music industry, inside of your music <laughs> career that really, really helped you out. So what would that be for you, Jules? For me, honestly, the best thing that I could have done this year was kind of just throw crap at the wall and see what sticks. Oh, I love that. It was um what I mentioned before of everything kind of came crumbling down on me like earlier or later last year. I came to a point where I just had to like throw my hands up in the air and just be, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And I remember distinctively like I was in this this studio that I had I'd spent the night in this studio. <laughs> And um, I was talking with my mom on the phone and she, I don't know, she had said something about like, just set like three goals for yourself. And I set up these three goals and I was like, these seem kind of unrealistic. And I reached out to everyone and everyone, everyone and anyone I could that could help me reach these goals. And Mm. some of them didn't work out. Most of the people didn't respond, but there, there's always going to be at least one person who responds to, you know, 30 emails mm-hmm. or whatnot. And throwing throwing crap at the wall and seeing what sticks, like what stuck was really a, a pivotal moment, I guess, for me. We don't always have the power to control, but we have the power to surrender. And I think that's part of of surrendering is just kind of like doing everything that you can. If it doesn't work out, that's not going to be, it's not, it's not going to be that route, but like, you know, there are going to be things that do work out and like follow that and to, to really pay attention to the things that are going right. And yeah, I guess that's a long, <laughs> a long <laughs> thing, but yeah, that really, that's, that was the the best thing I could have ever done. So just to clarify and just make sure that I understand. So you're saying the one of the greatest things that you've done for your music career is you use the words throwing, throwing crap at the wall. So in this case, you were reaching out out to a bunch of people and just, you know, for, for help with these specific goals that you were looking for. And because you reached out to so many people, you did get a response back. Whereas opposed to if you just reached out to like one or two people, mm. obviously like no one would reach back out kind of a thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And I guess it has to do with a lot with what I said was my, my biggest mistake was being too precious. And for me, it was being too precious and like, oh, this person has to respond. And then, um, like picking only a few people to, to email or to reach out to you. And then, and like now it's, it, it, you know, instead to reach out to a bunch of people who may like, you know, be in the same realm of, you know, of that sort of work and like create those relationships. And like someone's got to, you know, someone's got to respond by throwing crap at the wall. I mean, like reaching, reaching out to people, like people are a lot more like for me, I was like, people are like keeping me out. And like, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what I was telling uh-huh. myself. People are a lot more um, inviting and welcoming than you think they are. And it's really like putting yourself out there is what I mean. <laughs> is what I mean by that. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That that makes a lot of sense. And 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 I agree with 
that, right? One of the main reasons why people don't release songs, at least that I've that I've come across, is that they're afraid of the response of the song, right? One of the main reasons why they don't reach out to the record label is because they're afraid of the response of the record label. One yeah. of the reasons why they, they don't reach out to so-and-so to collaborate is because they're afraid they're going to be turned down or so on and so forth, right? Listen, like... I think I, I said this in an episode so 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 long ago when it was talking when I was talking about like how to network inside of the industry and I told them I gave my listeners the challenge right now like literally right now DM 10 of your favorite producers mm. you will be blown away about how many of them get back to you literally mm. if, even if you just say I love your music you'll be blown away about how many of them get back to yeah. you yeah right and because at the end of the day there's really I love these kind of sayings that we're just like weaving into this conversation mm-hmm. um, <laughs> one of the greatest sayings that I've heard about that whenever you're afraid to talk to someone or or you're afraid to reach out or so on and so forth the saying is in the morning we all got to put on pants Mm. and that just emphasizes the point that we are all human right at the end of the day other producers other people no matter how big their followings are they are still human right they still have they still have organs and blood and a brain and skin just like you do right and in the morning they all got to put on pants and so that we're not dealing with an alien race here we're not dealing with robots we're not dealing with with beings that are so vastly different than us that we have to play by a completely different game than we've ever learned, right? We are still humans and we can reach out to them. And the more that we reach out to them, but the better we're going to get at reaching out to them and so on and so forth so we can gain those relationships and work with these people, right? Is that is that yeah, what I'm hearing from exactly. you? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I I heard this on some other, <laughs> some other podcast I was listening to, but it was something about you get like a hundred rejections before you hear like, a yes. And like, you gotta, you gotta really think about that too. It's like, you gotta, you gotta reach out to people. You got it. Like eat, a lot of people might not even, they, they won't even say no. They just even worse will respond. And like, that's okay. That's right. You know, you just gotta put yourself out there. And for me, I was always so insecure about like, what are these people going to think of me if I just like, like sending a cold email or something. And it's really, it's really not that bad. The worst thing they could say is no. And, and then you kind of got your answer, you know, Jules on behalf of all of Dawn Nation, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> on the show because you have spent this time and the energy building your music career and you have chose to share this wisdom this has now made it easier for all of Dot Nation to be able to have a thriving music career yeah. because now they don't have to go through the same pain that you went through right you went yeah. through the thickets you figured out the stuff and now those people and now the people listening can take that and apply it to them so we thank you so much for that that was incredible oh, for you to do thank you so much for having me I really appreciate it I love I love Dot Nation and everything that you guys are about so thank you so much for having me on here Dot Nation I feel absolutely compelled to remind you that there is a free sample pack waiting for you down in the description. You can use it any way that you want to. She's Jewel. She's amazing. All right. She is amazing. She is she is Jewels is amazing. Wow, that was a lot. Anyways, there is a link down in the description. Make sure to go check that out. And again, if you are currently struggling with being creative and you want to learn how to make 30 songs in 30 days, I'm not joking. Head on over to donnation.net slash crywolf and you can take the crywolf masterclass. But Don Nation, we're not done here. No, no, no. You have some homework. The next thing that you're going to need to do is go check out the Behind the Dot episode with Chime. Okay, that's literally just a couple episodes ago. If you love this episode, you're going to love that episode. We'll see you over there.